Please join me in welcoming back to the stage, Sarah Gadden. Thank you. Thank you all for staying. Yeah, thank <laughs> you for staying. Appreciate it. It's a longer but lovely one. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, maybe we can begin with, uh, when we were just talking when the movie was on, you mentioned it, but off the top as well, Cleo de Sanca set was the first film you saw. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, about that film and you, you were drawing some interesting connections between that and one sings, the other doesn't? Yeah, well, I, f I, first, saw, uh, I first saw Cleo from 5 to 7 in uh, first year intro to film theory and criticism. And I remember it so well. It was such an impactful film for me. It was like I was hit by lightning when I watched it because I had never before seen a film that explored um, female subjectivity and as an actor, I'd, I'd never seen a film that uh, really directly spoke about the gaze and what it meant to be an object of that gaze and be in, in be aware of that gaze. And so for me, it was uh, this kind of monumental film, being able to, to feel uh, so connected to something. Um, and then I kind of, it opened up my world to, to Varda and who she was and, you know, the filmmaker that she was. But... I think even then, and this was over a decade ago, she was really just still kind of a footnote in, in film theory and criticism. She was the godmother of the French New Wave, and she wasn't kind of appreciated, I think, for the extent of her body of work. And as I started to kind of explore her and choose to study her at every opportunity I had, <laughs> I, I, learned, I learned what an incredible artist she was. Uh, and then I think... Watching this film, it, it was. Uh, I think there are a lot of connections to to Cleo from Five to Seven, uh, especially because uh, Apple's a pop singer or a folk singer, and uh, and there's that the showgirl moment, um, which being a film that was made in the '70s, often when a woman would pause and sing, that was a moment in which the audience could stop and appreciate her for her beauty or appreciate her as this object. And it must have been so jarring in the 70s for that object to be singing, you know, uh, pro, pro-choice pro rhetoric um, and how jarring that would have been for the audience. And that's kind of the power, I think, of female fil filmmakers is taking that these things that were our traditional images and how we see traditional images and really just turning them on their head and opening them up to be something different or something else. And we were talking too about um, images and representation and of course photography or the photographer plays a role in this film. And of course Varda began her career as a photographer as well. Um, but we were talking about the opening sequence of the poem and, and finding uh, Jerome and his sort of, well, demise. Um, wonder if you could expand a bit on on how you read that moment. Yeah, I thought that that was a great moment when she kind of walks into the 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 shop and kind of rejects his images of women and being a photographer herself, I wonder, you know, how much of that is intentional uh, being a, a female photographer and I was thinking is it too literal to say that is what you know when Jerome kills himself is it okay to read the film in a sense that in order for a woman to kind of make choices about herself there's a part of her that has to kill the desire of the man and the expectation of what his image of her should be uh, so that was something that I was like I wonder if anyone else felt that way or if that was just me uh, but I thought that that was kind of interesting knowing that she was a photographer um, well, we can open it up to the audience as well. Um, we do have microphones on either side, so just wait. Uh, ask that you wait until they get to you. Uh, it's very funny that you should say that because I th I thought that exact thing. Oh, you did. <laughs> yeah, oh, great. yeah. The the thing about how he was like, oh, I have to break these women down, you know, and then I get to the real woman inside of them, and she's just like, no. <laughs> Yeah, or and, there, there's that discrepancy between her, his, him trying to find this idea of her, and her just kind of standing there naked, saying, "This is me. This yeah. is how I feel. Yeah, exactly. take a photo of it." And he's like, "Not good enough," <laughs> yeah. you know. And, and I, and I, then, I, and then later he says, "I was too weak. I couldn't break her down. She was too stubborn, or I was too weak." And I'm like, 
well, I guess you'll have to kill yourself. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Happy that Easter. Was amazing. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Hope you had a nice Passover as well. <laughs> Uh, it is interesting, though, because the last film that we screened... Oh, no, sorry. We've screened two films since this one, but we were talking about Le Bonheur as well, which does have a, a female potential suicide. Um, but I think something that's interesting in this film is you, know, you have his death, um, but it's also about then women, women putting forth their own images so that mm -hmm. there is this filling of the void as well and it's not just um necessarily an end of you know representation of women but just taking the power into their their own hands as yeah well. and you know i think that they're both impacted by his death that's not to kind of be you know crass and say that his death doesn't have an impact on them but we were speaking about how varda is you know she she makes these very feminist films but they're not nihilistic they're very hopeful in a lot of ways, so his death isn't the end of their lives. It's, in a way, the beginning of of their freedom and the beginning of how they choose to define what their lives are gonna look like and what their families are gonna look like. And so, even though it is kind of, you know, very purposefully this utopian, you know, fam blended, diverse kind of family at the end, I, I think that there I think that it's great that it's kind of has this hopeful ending to it. Um, and I, I and I derive a lot of hope from it just as an artist and as a woman who's who's kind of chosen this kind of not very conventional path and I'm you know an actor and I go from job to job and I live a transient life and and it makes me feel very hopeful that having a family is, is possible and having a family any kind of way that it so happens to me is also possible. And I find that hopeful today in 2018. And, you know, the film was made in the 70s, so. Same. <laughs> well, another thing that we were speaking about as well is this, you know, we have the sort of dualities of ending where Suzanne gets um, a doctor, which is, you know, a nice snag, I guess. Yeah. Sorry, that was maybe inappropriate. And then you have, the, you know, yeah. Palm is still in this more communal living <laughs> and, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yes, Saturday. No, it's Friday. Um, but but not judging either woman for sort of the choices they make. Um, but I also want to talk a bit more about the the communal representation at the end too, because I think that's something. And you know, we were talking a bit about you know on film sets when people might have their kids there or people might not, and that's usually a gender divide of sometimes who's behind the camera as well. Yeah, I think that one thing that I love so much about the film is that it's this exploration of this beautiful female friendship and they're at different points in their lives throughout the entire film but there's no judgment of either of them about their life about their life choices and I think that that's a really beautiful representation of what adult female friendships can be uh, but I was saying I was saying to Kiva um, that on Alias Grace it was directed by Mary Heron who's a woman produced by Sarah Pauly and written by Sarah Pauly who's a woman and and uh, produced by Noreen Halpern, who's also a woman, and uh, and their kids were were present often on set. They weren't kind of off away somewhere else, being taken care of by somewhere else. They were very much involved in our show, and and their responsibilities and their duties as moms was also present. You know, we would talk about rehearsals, and if you know, it was okay. It wasn't a taboo thing for a woman to say. Uh, actually, I need to finish by three o'clock because I need to go and pick up my kids or I can't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a taboo thing to say and nobody was judging them for saying it. And because of that, so many of the men that we worked with brought their families to set and brought their kids to set and had their kids involved in levels of production. And that was really special too, to kind of create that space. And I guess Varda ultimately did that as well, because as I said off the top, Rosalie, Rosalie's integral in her production company and that ended up producing Faces Places too. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, you know, you can make the next generation as well. Mm -hmm. um, there was another point that uh, that came up a lot on, on Alias Grace and it was the strong female character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we were talking about how, um, well, you should talk about the that article or the... 
Well, yeah. she just really flipped it on me. Yeah. Uh, no, there's, an, uh, there's an article in The Guardian called the... <laughs> you don't want the hotspot anymore? <laughs> um, called the um, the male gaze. And uh, it was essentially about how um, that's failed art and failed women working in art, whether that was photography, film, or um, novels, any any so anything like this, and how we can reduce stories that have all around uh, that are centered around women to being um, small or domestic um, you know the idea of the rom-com or female friendship basically being a uh, jealous rivalry or just sort of a you know, like cutesy love story between two women that's you know platonic yeah. yeah and so we were we were talking about that article in relationship to the the kind of press year of press that I've just kind of come off of with alias grace and how a lot of journalists kind of lead with oh you know you got to play a strong female character and just kind of how that diminishes and belittles the work um because i guess it just kind of makes it feel like it's a fringe project um and it and it's not and so i yeah we were just talking about that i don't know what how does it relate to the movie i can't remember well just because <laughs> still again this is you know from the 70s to now and we still are talking about like oh it's so great yeah. or that you had said like oh there's you know two two margaret atwood series both with strong female leads and it was like two in one year we've done it yeah or like a lot of journalists would try and pit pit our shows against each other even though they're completely different um and and they would say like, oh, you know, it must be really hard having another show out there that, you know, is also, you know, has a strong female character. And it's like, really? You would never say this to a guy. You would never say, wow, so you're a superhero. How does it feel to have so many superheroes out there? It must be really competitive amongst the superheroes. <laughs> and you're like, this is not a conversation that would even exist. And I guess and I wanted to underline that as well, because as, as you noted off the top, um, I also discovered Varda a decade ago in my undergrad, um, but she wasn't uh, a central figure. Um, and I was really lucky that I had a very, um, a very feminist minded professor who wanted to include her in very much make her central in the French New Wave uh, class that I was taking. But that's not always the case and I think it's still because you know films like this or films you know directed by women are seen as like a, a niche somehow even though yeah. we make up 50% of the population. But I think also after the the kind of the past year in the film industry with coming off of movements like Me Too and Time's Up and After Me Too I don't think it's a coincidence that we're all now sitting in a theater celebrating this retrospective of this director's work um, at a time where you know you couldn't even find this movie to watch if you if you you know tried to if you were trying to find it yourself so I think that that is also an indicator of of how far we've come and where we're at it's such a joyous thing to be able to it's it's Varda hopeful is what it is I like that <laughs> And we were also speaking about her, this tone again, too, of, and I think one of the quotations is included on the slides that you see, that, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be a happy or a joyful feminist, but I was angry. Um, but again, I think that what we see, you know, this film is obviously very political, and uh, a lot of her films are, whether overtly like this or just in the subtext of what's happening in the background. Um, but that that anger, as Sarah was saying, isn't nihilism. There's um, there's a reason behind it, and and I think personally, if you're angry about something, it's because you care and you care to change it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, you know, I think that there was there, you know, before a lot of the the movements in film, it was very kind of a point of tension to say publicly, oh, I'm a feminist or cinema is gendered. And I think that that was a lot of thing that, a, a lot of things that female directors um, shied away from is, is the discussion of gender in cinema because they didn't want to be ghettoized in this, you know, feminist, feminist film niche, you know, market. Um, and I think that that's the thing that that Varda does is she just she goes there, but she goes there in a way that is quite accessible to to people. And I think also because of the the hopefulness that she has to kind of inspire change and inspire change with filmmaking, people so many people really connect to her movies, even you know decades after they've been made. I would like to open it up to the audience. Hi, um, just um, 
I think it was really cool what you were saying about how Varda uses uh, the showgirl convention and and uses it subversively. And just to kind of add on to that, there's a lot of discussion during this time in French film culture about um, how to not only how to create a kind of progressive and resistant film language and style, but also how to develop an essentially feminist film style. And you, you know, you, you hear that in Cahiers de Cinema and, and Talkel and those type of journals. And so it's really interesting how I was wondering at first when, while I was watching the film, uh, I thought it was, it was, um, you know, using much more conventional sort of means of parallelism and melodramatic exposition. But it's really interesting how Varda uses specifically the musical as a means of developing a kind of more radical, direct address to the audience. And so if you compare her or think of her as responding to someone like Jean-Luc Godard, who in a film like Weekend would have a character just read a political text directly to the audience, here you have her doing almost the same thing with the angles and the bourgeoisie and how the, the woman is the proletariat, but she's doing it in such a more um, palatable and enjoyable way, even though she's kind of achieving the same ends of developing this, this very radical film style. So I think that just reinforces uh, some of the comments you were making. I, I totally agree. I think, and I think that's why I was so struck by Cleo from five to seven when I when I watched it for the first time was because of her because of the the filmmaking devices that she used to draw you into the narrative and then make you contemplate your existence in it at the same time and I think that that's one of the the kind of keys to her as a filmmaker and why her work is so incredible is her ability to do that um, so I'm I'm glad that you that you that you picked up on that. And to plug a few other things in the retrospective as well, um, her her partner, Jacques Demy, uh, made very unconventional musicals, and they had a very long and productive um, uh, partnership. And uh, he wasn't the father of Rosalie. Um, actually, Antoine from Cléo de saint Cassette was. Um, but uh, they did, that. Yeah, but they did have one child together, though Demi's sexuality was always... Um, in question, but they had this really beautiful partnership that lasted up until the end of his life. And, um, you know, her California work that she was making is because he was making films like Model Shop in uh, Los Angeles. So she went over to, you know, work and, and be around him. So there is some of that influence potentially as well. And sorry, those films are showing mid-April or four, we have four Demi films showing in mid-April. So come up for that too. Um, were there further questions from the audience? Um, I wanted to ask um, in relation to um, uh, the this film focuses essentially on two female characters, but uh, it also focuses um, because of the narrative on the male characters they encounter, and um, you know there's like a lot of um, uh, obviously there's mostly male directors in the business. Uh, and a lot of these male directors uh, don't really focus on, you know, some of the female characters or don't, you know, uh, particularly uh, make them complicated or memorable. And I was really impressed by how um, just the male, the supporting male characters that uh, some of the, that the two characters uh, end up interacting with are complex and, um, you know, have different views on certain things. And there's a wonderful little scene uh, towards the end where um, where um, Suzanne's daughter just um, you know is on the streets with a, a, a young man and she just you know confidently uh, gives her opinion on relationships and and how it should you know um, go in her view and I like this is just really impressive to me um, given you know that uh, to, to say that no matter what gender you are you're a completely able to um, kind of analyze this uh, different uh, characters from different genders perfectly. Yeah, I think there's something about capturing the world as is, as which is full, 
full of different kinds of people, different genders, different races, different backgrounds. And I think that's something that you can track throughout Varda's work. Um, but you know, generally, we tend to not question the one point of view that we see put in front of us, which is usually a straight white male and like Eurocentric or um, North American perspective. Um, but suddenly when the world sort of exploded as such, which isn't about erasing other people or saying, no, you're not part of the discussion, but saying like, no, we've actually always been here and we've always been listening and sort of, I guess, including it like that. I'm not sure if that's a... Yeah, I think I, I, again, I think it is, it also kind of signals to Varda's hopefulness is that she doesn't condemn the men in the, in their, in her film for, for the choices that they make or how they live their life, you know, especially with Jerome being married and not really being able to support his family or even publicly acknowledge his family. She doesn't really seem to condemn him. Both women still really love him in the film. Um, and I think that that's really beautiful. Um, and I think that I love, I love the moment at the end of the movie where the daughter is kind of negotiating her sexual encounter in an extremely articulate way. I, I remember thinking, how could somebody dedicate an abortion film to their daughter? You know, what, like what, that seems like a contradiction, but it's not, it's, it's really the legacy that she, that Varda and, you know, women who are, you know, pro-choice feel that they're giving to their children is the ability to choose the path and choose their, you know, make choices for their own life. And those choices aren't made for them. And I think that that, message comes so full circle at the end with that moment with the daughter. And I think that that's kind of the, the, the biggest, you know, most triumphant pro-choice moment more so than the pop songs and the, you know, the rallies and the rhetoric. It's, it's that moment of the next generation saying, I'm, I'm aware of my body. I, I, and I'm making these choices based on what I want. I think that's a beautifully perfect way to wrap up this evening. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so, so much for being here. Thank, thank you, you for coming. All so much. Really appreciate it. The thank series you so continues much. continues until April 17th, so we hope to see you out at, uh, at some of the further screenings. And we have one tomorrow, Vagabond, with uh, director Lina Rodriguez. So please come out to that as well. Vagabond's great if you haven't seen it. It's really great. <laughs>